Good morning. A quick disclaimer to save myself from grief. If you are a massive SpaceX fan and feel that they can do no wrong, then you're going to get triggered by this video and I advise that you click off of it now. Because even though I was really impressed with what happened yesterday, even though the launch was more exciting than just about anything I have ever witnessed, when it comes right down to it, SpaceX is lucky that that thing didn't blow up on the pad. On a beautiful spring morning, thousands of excited people prepared to watch the most powerful rocket in human history take flight. This was the rocket that was going to spearhead mankind's next mission to the moon. And as it prepared to take flight, its builders were both nervous and overjoyed that they had accomplished so much in such a short period of time. But from the moment of ignition, there were problems. One engine failed almost immediately, and then a cascading series of engines began to fail as the rocket continued to climb. Undaunted, mission control continued to press on and try to achieve as much altitude as possible. However, the cascade continued to grow worse, and ultimately, the flight termination charges were triggered approximately 20 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Was this the flight of Starship? Well, no. I think as many of us probably know, it was the flight of the Soviet N1. However, the flight of Starship that happened yesterday was not actually terribly dissimilar from the first flight of the ill-fated Soviet super rocket. As a matter of fact, there are a number of things about yesterday's flight that made it even more problematic than what the Soviets were trying to achieve over 50 years ago on that fateful winter morning, actually, of February 21st, 1969. And although everything that SpaceX accomplished yesterday was spectacular, and even though I was very, very impressed with how the rocket performed, there were a number of things, especially when we're talking about the launch pad and the ground systems, that in my opinion, look downright amateurish. <laughs> While SpaceX employees and SpaceX fans, which included myself, began to lose their minds around the world when Starship began to take flight, successfully rising from the launch pad after nearly 10 seconds worth of firing the extremely powerful Raptor 2 engines, most of the thrilled onlookers had little idea just what kind of havoc Starship was wreaking on the ground below, and not because there was a problem with a rocket, it's because there was a massive problem with the launch pad and the launch facility in general. Have a look at this.
just to be clear, this kind of chaos is not typical with any kind of rocket launch. Even the extremely powerful SLS, which did more damage than anticipated to the NASA mobile launch tower, didn't come close to the havoc wrought by Starship at the Boca Chica pad. And let me be clear about one thing. The rocket performed spectacularly. All of these failed engines that you're looking at right now, I am utterly shocked that so many engines actually function properly given how much shrapnel was flying around as the rocket dug a massive crater underneath itself in the less than 10 seconds that it took to rise off of the pad. It again is a testament to the resilience of the Starship vehicle and the incredible power of the Raptor 2 engines. That having been said though, it is very, very fortunate that Starship was intact enough to rise from the pad at all as opposed to exploding on the pad or perhaps careening straight into the launch tower itself out of control. Think I'm exaggerating? Have a look at the liftoff from this perspective from NASA spaceflight. And just to be perfectly clear, it is never, ever a good thing when a rocket rises from the launch pad at anything other than a perfectly vertical angle, which clearly it was not doing. SpaceX was already beginning to lose control of this rocket from the moment of takeoff, and had it veered in the opposite direction, straight into the tower as opposed to away from it, we wouldn't be talking about damage done to the launch pad. We would be talking about damage done to the village of Boca Chica and quite possibly to Port Isabel and South Padre Island as well. This rocket and its unbelievable power is something that needs to be feared and respected. And quite frankly, I don't think that whoever was responsible for designing the SpaceX launch pad was taking this into account. You have heard me on many occasions criticize SpaceX for not putting a flame trench in place and yesterday launch definitely demonstrates just how desperately precautions like this are needed. NASA puts flame trenches onto their launch pads, especially for very powerful rockets, for an extremely good reason, because powerful rockets will wreak this kind of damage on concrete in a very short amount of time if you don't take the proper precautions. And instead of just bits of concrete or small chunks or little boulders or whatever you want to call it, Starship ripped up entire blocks of concrete and hurled them a significant distance away from the launch pad. I'm going to be going to check out the damage in a couple of hours, and I will be very surprised if I don't find concrete hundreds of meters, if not kilometers, away from the pad. Let me give you a quick review as to why flame trenches are so important. The heat and energy generated by a large amount of thrust, in other words, double of what the Saturn V was capable of, perhaps even a bit more than that, will severely damage both the launch pad and the rocket if it hits and reflects directly off the launch pad and into the vehicle and launch structure. As a result, the flames from a rocket's first stage boosters travel through openings in the launch pad onto a flame deflector situated in the trench which runs underneath the launch structure and extends well beyond the launch pad itself. The flame deflector redirects the flames away from the launch pad and rocket and flows horizontally along the length of the flame trench before exiting the structure at a safe distance where it expands into billowing clouds of smoke that one typically observes. Although they're primarily used at orbital rocket launch facilities, flame trench deflector systems are also used at rocket testing facilities like at the Stennis Space Center. Flame trenches also typically have something called a flame deflector situated directly underneath the rocket that has a concave shape to angle and deflect the hot exhaust gases blowing down into the trench where they run horizontally before exiting the trench at a safe distance from the launch pad and the rocket. The shuttle flame trench is made from concrete, and by the way, they use this for SLS as well, and also things like Falcon Heavy, Falcon 9, and just about every rocket that SpaceX 
SpaceX launches, and they're covered with refractory heat-resistant bricks, while the flame deflector consists of a strong steel structure covered with a 127 millimeter layer of a high-temperature concrete-like material known as fondue fire. The consequences of not having a flame trench and a flame deflector beneath your super rocket should be pretty obvious at this point. The damage is even worse than I anticipated, and if an idiot like me can see why we need to have these kinds of precautions beneath the most powerful rocket in human history, why did it not occur to the engineers at SpaceX? Was it just a matter of expense, or is there something wrong with the marshy terrain that simply makes a flame trench impossible or impractical? Well, Cape Canaveral isn't exactly the most stable of geologies either, and yet they're able to do it out there, so I don't see why this was so impossible at Boca Chica. I really think that it may have just been a matter of cost and also the amount of time that it would take to dig such a thing, or perhaps the environmental impact of that kind of project, and perhaps the FAA didn't clear it. And if that's the case, the FAA are a load of fools, because if they're supposed to be guaranteeing the safety of the public, what happened yesterday was decidedly unsafe. So now that I've gotten SpaceX fans whipped up into a frenzy and ready to get out their pitchforks and their torches to come hunt me down, I want to be clear about one thing. I actually meant what I said in the thumbnail. Starship itself, as a rocket, performed beautifully yesterday. It was indeed a massive success of the vehicle. And why do I believe this? Because it actually survived that maelstrom of broken concrete and God knows what else, including the reverberations of the sound waves from the launch pad just shaking the rivets out of the stainless steel. It's amazing that this rocket actually survived that hellish experience and managed to get as far as it did. It is a fantastic rocket, and even with all the engine failures, it managed to climb to a substantial altitude reaching about 38 kilometers, according to the last reports on the matter, which again is an amazing accomplishment for a rocket that frankly should have been blown to bits on the pad given the circumstances that it had to take off in. This was not a failure of SpaceX engineering when it comes to their rocket science. Starship is a phenomenal machine, and if it had taken off from a proper facility, I think it's very possible that it would have been able to complete its orbital test entirely yesterday. Yesterday. Starship would have crashed down, splashed down, whatever, off the coast of Hawaii with very few issues. I think that the failure to separate was a direct result of all the damage the rocket no doubt took as it was attempting to lift off. We, of course, are not going to know all of these details until an in-depth analysis can be carried out. However, I think there's a strong possibility that SpaceX is going to find all kinds of damage and system failures failures within seconds of liftoff, and the problems that manifested later in the flight, including the failure of stage separation, are a direct result of the damage that Starship took the moment that ignition began. And this is a huge tragedy if that is indeed the case, because this is the vehicle that's supposed to be taking us back to the moon. In three years, somehow, SpaceX has to go from where it is now with Starship to a vehicle that's capable of maintaining a very rapid cadence of launches and refueling in orbit. I don't see how they're going to be able to accomplish this in a mere three years, especially given the amount of time that it's going to take them to patch up the damage at the launch pad because obviously it's not going to be sufficient to simply rebuild this pad as it was and repair the OLM. This has to be a complete fundamental redesign, and it's going to take a very long time to implement something that ambitious. And if SpaceX has any ideas about trying to lift off from Cape Canaveral, I think NASA is going to be very, very hesitant to allow this rocket to take off from their facilities, especially given the fact 
the Starship's new launch tower at Cape Canaveral is dangerously close to LC-39B, where NASA launches the Space Launch System. And as critical as I have been of SLS in the three years since I started this channel, I am now far more concerned that the Starship HLS is going to be the main Achilles heel in the entire Artemis plan. I don't see how this ship is going to be ready to rendezvous with Orion in lunar orbit after having refueled at least half a dozen times in LEO, land on the lunar surface, and then safely return astronauts to lunar orbit after that. Oh yeah, and by the way, it's going to have to use those Raptor 2s in order to take off from the moon at all once the astronauts visit there. That seems extremely problematic to me, especially in 1-6 gravity. Now, it is going to be using secondary engines in order to set down on the moon, but I don't see how this massive rocket is going to be able to successfully lift off from the moon and achieve lunar orbit without using the Raptor 2s. And as I said, that could be extremely problematic as well. Now, I want to be 100% clear. Starship achieved amazing things as a rocket yesterday. I am 100% convinced that this is the rocket that's going to be taking us to the moon, Mars, throughout the solar system. This is undoubtedly the rocket of the future. And had a proper launch facility been constructed that frankly makes the cobbled together ML-1 that NASA is currently using for SLS look like a work of engineering genius, I think Starship might very well have completed an orbit of the Earth and been well on its way to becoming a completely functional system in the next three years or perhaps even sooner. And because Starship's first orbital test was foiled by something that had nothing to do with Starship itself, well, that makes me the angriest of all. Please smash that like. Please hit that subscribe. Those of you who have not already abandoned my channel because of my critical analysis here. And once again, please be clear. I want Starship to succeed. I think that this is definitely the rocket of the future. But at the same time, that shouldn't make us completely oblivious to the obvious problems that manifested themselves yesterday. And as always, guys, Stay angry about space.